section one of the white wolf and other fireside tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The White Wolf and Other Fireside Tales by Sir Arthur Thomas Quiller Couch. Section 1 Miracle of the White Wolf. Part 1 The Tale of Snorri Gamlison. In the early summer of 1358, with the breaking up of the ice there came to brodelid in greenland a merchant ship from norway with provisions for the christian settlements on the coast the master's name was snorri gamlason and it happened that as he sailed into eric's fjord and warped alongside the quay word was brought to him that the bishop of garda had arrived that day in Brodelid to hold a confirmation, whereupon this Snorri went ashore at once, and, getting audience of the bishop, gave him a little book with an account of how he had come by it. The book was written in Danish, and Snorri could not understand a word of it, being, indeed, unable to read or to write but he told this tale his ship about three weeks before had run into a calm which lasted for three days and two nights and with a northerly drift she fell away little by little towards a range of icebergs which stretched across and ahead of them in a solid chain but about noon of the third day the colour of the sky warned him of a worse peril and soon there came up from the westward a bank of fog with snow in it and a wind that increased until they began to hear the ice grinding and breaking up as it seemed all around them snorri steered at first for the southward where had been open water but by and by found that even here were drifting bergs he therefore put his helm down and felt his way through the weather by short boards and so with the most of his men stationed forward to keep a lookout fenced as it were with the danger steering and tacking until by god's grace the fog lifted and the wind blew gently once more and now in the clear sunshine he saw that the storm had been more violent than any had supposed since the wall of ice which before had been solid was now burst and riven in many places and in particular to the eastward where a broad path of water lay before them almost like a canal but winding here and there towards this snorri steered and entered it with a fair breeze they had come he said but to the second bend of this waterway when a seaman who had climbed the mast on the chance of spying an outlet called out in surprise that there was a ship ahead of them but two miles off and running down the channel before the wind even as they at first he found no credit for this tale and even when those on deck spied her mast and yard overtopping a gap between two bergs they could only set it down for a mirage or cheat of eyesight in the clear weather but by and by said snorri they could not doubt they were in chase of a ship and further that they were fast overtaking her for she steered with no method 
and shook with every slant of wind and anon went off before it like a helpless thing until in the end she was fetched up by the jutting foot of a berg and there shook her sail flapping with such noise that snorri's men heard it though yet a mile away they bore down upon her and now took note that this sail of hers was ragged and frozen so that it flapped like a jointed board and that her rigging hung in all ways and untended but stiff with rime and drawing yet nearer they saw an ice line about her hull so deep that her timbers seemed bitten through and a great pile of frozen snow upon her poop banked even above her tiller but no helmsman and no living soul upon her then snorri let lower his boat and was rowed towards her and coming alongside gave a hail which was unanswered but from the frozen pile by the tiller there stuck out a man's arm ghastly to see snorri climbed on board by the waist where her sides were low and a well reached aft from the mast to the poop there was a cabin beneath the poop and another and larger room under the deck forward between the step of the mast and the bows into each of these he broke with axes and bars and in the one found nothing but some cooking pots and bedding but in the other that is the after cabin the door as he burst it in almost fell against a young man seated by a bed so lifelike was he that snorri called aloud in the doorway but anon peering into the gloomy place perceived the body to be frozen upright and stiff and that on the bed lay another body of a lady slight and young and very fair she too was dead and frozen yet her cheeks albeit white as the pillow against which they rested had not lost their roundness snorri took note also of her dress and of the coverlet reaching from the bed's foot to her waist that they were of silk for the most part and richly embroidered and her shift and the bedsheets about her of fine linen the man's dress was poor and coarse by comparison yet he carried a sword and was plainly of gentle nurture the sword snorri drew from its sheath and brought away also he took a small box of jewels but little else could he find on the ship and no food of any kind his design was to leave the ship as he found it carrying away only these tokens that his story when he arrived at brodelid might be received with faith and to direct where the ship might be sought for but as he quitted the cabin some of his men shouted from the deck where they had discovered yet another body frozen in a drift this was an old man seated with crossed legs and leaning against the mast having an inkhorn slung about his neck and almost hidden by his grey beard and on his knee a book which he held with a thumb frozen between two pages this was the book which snorri had brought to brodelid and which the bishop of garda read aloud to him that same afternoon translating as he went the ink being fresh the writing clerkly and scarcely a page damaged by the weather it bore no title but the bishop who afterwards caused his secretary to take a copy of the tale gave it a very long one beginning god's mercy shone in a miracle upon certain castaways from jutland at the feast of the nativity of his blessed son our lord in the year thirteen fifty seven 
whereby he made dead trees to put forth in leaf and comforted desperate men with summer in the midst of the frozen sea with much beside but all this appears in the tale which i will head only with the name of the writer end of section one Section two of the White Wolf and Other Fireside Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The White Wolf and Other Fireside Tales by Sir Arthur Thomas Quiller Couch section two miracle of the white wolf part two peter kurtz manuscript now that our troubles are over and i sit by the mast of our late unhappy ship not knowing if i am on earth or in paradise but full fed and warm in all my limbs yea pierced and glowing with the love of almighty god i am resolved to take pen and use my unfrozen ink in telling out of what misery his hand hath led us to this present eden i who write this am peter kurt and i was the steward of my master ebby while he dwelt in his own castle of nebegard poor he was then and poor i suppose he is still in all but love and the favour of god but in those days the love was but an old servant's to wit my own and the favour of god not evident but the poverty on the other hand bitterly apparent in all our housekeeping we lived alone with a handful of servants sometimes as few as three in the castle which stands between the sand hills and the woods as you sail into vale fjord all these woods as far away as to rosenfold had been the good knight his father's but were lost to us before ebby's birth and leased on pledge to the knight bore of egeskov of who i am to tell and with them went all the crew of verderers huntsmen grooms prickers and ostringers that had kept nebgard cheerful the year round his mother had died at my master's birth and the knight himself but two years after so that the lad grew up in his poverty with no heritage but a few barren acres of sand a tumbling house and his father's sword and small prospect of winning the broad lands out of bore's clutches nevertheless under my tutoring he grew into a tall lad and a bold a good swordsman skilful at the tilt and in handling a boat but not talkative or free in his address of strangers the most of his days he spent in fishing or in the making and mending of gear and his evenings after our lesson in sword-play in the reading of books of which nebgard had good store and specially of the icelanders scalds and sagamen also at times in the study of latin with me who had been bred to the priesthood but left it for love of his father my foster-brother and now had no ambition of my own but to serve this lad and make him as good a man but there were days when he would have naught to do with fishing or with books dark days when i forbore and left him to mope by the dunes or in the great garden which had been his mother's but was now a wilderness untended and it was then that he first met with the lady mette 
for as he walked there one morning a little before noon a swift shadow passed overhead between him and the sun and almost before he could glance upward a body came dropping out of the sky and fell with a thud among the rose bushes by the eastern wall it was a heron and after it swooped the bird which had murdered it a white gare falcon of the kind which breeds in greenland but a trained bird as he knew by the sound of the bells on her legs as she plunged through the bushes ebby ran at once to the corner where the birds struggled but as he picked up the pelt he happened to glance towards the western wall and in the gateway there stood a maiden with her hand on the bridle of a white palfrey her dog came running towards ebby as he stood he beat it off and carrying the pelt across to its mistress waited a moment silently cap in hand while she called the great falcon back to its lure and leashed it to her wrist which seemed all too slight for the weight then as ebby held out the dead heron she shook her head and laughed i am not sure sir that i have any right to it we flushed it yonder between the wood and the sand-hills and though i did not stay to consider i think it must belong to the owner of the shoreland it is true said ebby that i own the shoreland and the forest too if law could enforce right but for the bird you are welcome to it and to as many more as you care to kill upon this she knit her brows the forest but i thought that the forest was my father's my name said she is mette and my father is the knight bore of eskakoff i am ebby of nebergard and said he perceiving the mirth in her eyes you have heard the rhyme upon me ebby from nebby with all his men good has neither food nor firing wood i had not meant to be discourteous said she contritely but tell me more of these forest lands nay answered ebby hither comes riding your father with his men ask him for the story and when he has told it you may know why i cannot make him or his daughter welcome at nebegard to this she made no reply but with her hand on the palfrey's bridle went slowly back to meet her father who reined up at a little distance and waited offering ebby no salutation then a groom helped her to the saddle and the company rode away towards egeskov leaving the lad with the dead bird in his hand for weeks after this meeting he moped more than usual he had known before that sir bore would leave no son and that the lands of nebegard if ever to be won back must be wrested from a woman and this had never troubled him it troubled me the less because i hoped there might be another way than force and even if it should come to that sir bore's past treachery had killed in me all kindness towards his house male or female he and my old master and five other knights of the eastern coast had been heavily oppressed by the lord of trelde lars trolla who owned many ships and though no better than a pirate claimed a right of levying tribute along the shore that faces funan upon pretence of protecting it after enduring many raids and paying toll under threat for years these seven knights banded together to rid themselves of this robber but word of their meetings being carried to trolle he came secretly one night to nebegard with three ships crews broke down the doors and finding the seven assembled in debate made them prisoners and held them at ransom my master a poor man could only purchase release by the help of his comrade bore who found the ransom 
but took in exchange the lands of nebogard to hold them until repaid out of their revenues but of these he could never after be brought to give an account we on our side had lost the power to enforce it and behind his own strength he could now threaten us with lars trolles to whom he had been reconciled therefore i felt no tenderness for sir borre's house if by any means our estates could be recovered but after this meeting with sir borre's daughter i could see that my young lord went heavily troubled and i began to think of other means than force it may have been six months later that word came to us of great stir and bustle at egeskov sir borre being aged and anxious to see his daughter married before he died had proclaimed a bride show now the custom is and the rule that any suitor so he be of gentle birth may offer himself in these contests nor will the parents begin to bargain until he has approved himself a wise plan since it lessens the disputing which else might be endless so when this news reached us i looked at my master and he perceiving what i would say answered it if holgar will carry me said he we will ride to egeskov this holgar was a stout roan horse foaled at nebogard but now well advanced in years and the last of that red stock for which our stables had been famous he will carry you thither said i and by god's grace bring you home with a bride behind you upon this my master hung his head peter he said do not think i attempt this because it is the easier way it comes easier than fighting with a woman i answered but you will find it hard now when the old man begins to haggle i did not know then that the lad's heart was honestly given to this maid but so it was and had been from the moment when she stood before him in the gateway so to egeskov we rode and there found no less than forty suitors assembled and some with a hundred servants in retinue sir borre received us with no care to hide his scorn though the hour had not come for putting it into words and truly my master's arms were old-fashioned and with the dents they had honourably taken when they cased his father made a poor battered show for all my scouring nevertheless i had no fear when his turn came to ride the ring three rides had each wooer under the lady mette's eyes and three rings ebbe carried off and laid on the cushion before her she stooped and passed about his neck the gold chain which she held for the prize but i think they exchanged no looks only one other rider brought two rings and this was a son of lars trolle olaf by name a tall young knight and well favoured but disdainful whom i knew sir borre must favour if he could i could not see that the maiden favoured him above the rest yet i kept a close eye upon this youth and must own that in the jousting which followed he carried himself well for this the most of the wooers had fresh horses and i drew a long breath when at the close of the third course my master with two others remained in the lists for it had been announced to us that the last courses should be ridden on the morrow but now sir borre behaved very treacherously for perceiving as i am sure that the horse holgar was over-wearied and panting he gave word that the sport should not be stayed 
more by grace of heaven it was than by force of riding that ebby unhorsed his next man a knight's son from smalling but in the last course which he rode against olaf of trolle who had stood by his good honest beast came to the tilt cloth with knees trembling and at a touch rolled over though between the two lances i will swear there was nothing to choose i was quick to pick up my dear lad but he would have none of my comfort and limped away from the lists as one who had borne himself shamefully yea and my own heart was hot as i led holgar back to stable without waiting to see the prize claimed by one who though a fair fighter had not won it without foul aid having stalled holgar i had much ado to find his master again and endless work to persuade him to quit his sulks and join the other suitors in the hall that night when each presented his bride gift even when i had won him over he refused to take the coffer i placed in his hands though it held his mother's jewels few but precious but entering with the last as became his humble rank of esquire he laid nothing at the lady's feet save his sword and the chain that she herself had given him you bring little squire ebbe said the knight bore from his seat beside his daughter i bring what is most precious in the world to me said ebbe your lance is broken i believe said the old knight scornfully my lance is not broken he answered else you should have it to match your word and rising without a look at mette whose eyes were downcast he strode back to the door i had now given up hope for the maid showed no sign of kindness and the old man and the youth were like two dogs the very sight of the one set the other growling yet since to leave in a huff would have been discourteous i prevailed on my master to bide over the morrow and even to mount holgar and ride forth to the hunt which was to close the bride show he mounted indeed but kept apart and well behind mette and her brisk group of wooers for apart from his lack of inclination his horse was not yet recovered and by and by as the prickers started a deer the hunt swept ahead of him and left him riding alone he had a mind to turn aside and ride straight back to nebogard whither he had sent me on to announce him and dismally enough i obeyed when at the end of a green glade he spied mette returning alone on her white palfrey for i am tired of this hunting she told him as she came near and you does it weary you also that you lag so far behind it would never weary me he answered but i have a weary horse then let us exchange said she though mine is but a palfrey it would carry you better your roan betrayed you yesterday and it is better to borrow than to miss excelling my house answered ebbe still sulkily has had enough borrowing of egeskov and my horse may be valueless but he is one of the few things dear to me and i must keep him truly then said she your words were not last night when you professed to offer me the gifts most precious to you in the world and before he could reply to this she had pricked on and was lost in the woodland ebby sat for a while as she left him considering at the crossing of two glades then he twitched holgar's rein and turned back towards nebogard but at the edge of the wood spying a shepherd seated below in the plain by his flock he rode down to the man and called to him and said 
go this evening to egeskoff and greet the lady mette and say to her that ebbe of nebegard could not barter his good horse the last of his father's stable but that she may know he was honest in offering her the thing most precious to him tell her further what thou hast seen so saying he alighted off holgar and smoothing his neck whispered a word in his ear and the old horse turned his muzzle and rubbed it against his master's left palm whose right gripped a dagger and drove it straight for the heart this was the end of the roan stock of nebegard my master ebbe reached home that night with the mire thick on his boots having fed him i went to the stables and finding no holgar made sure that he had killed the poor beast in wrath for his discomfiture at the tilt the true reason he gave me many days after i misjudged him judging him by his father's temper on the morrow of the bride show the suitors took their leave of egeskoff under promise to return again at the month's end and hear how the lady mette had chosen so they went their ways none doubting that the fortunate one would be olaf of trelde and for me i blamed myself that we had ever gone to egeskoff but on the third morning after the bride show i changed this advice very suddenly for going at six of the morning to unlock our postern gate as my custom was i found a tall black stallion tethered there and left without a keeper his harness was of red leather and each broad crimson rein bore certain words embroidered on the one a straight quarrel is soonest mended on the other who will dare learns swiftness little time i lost in calling my master to admire and having read what was written he looked in my eyes and said i go back to egeskoff that is well done said i may the almighty god prosper it but said he doubtfully if i determine on a strange thing will you help me peter i may need a dozen men men without wives to miss them i can yet find a dozen such along the fjord i answered and we go on a long journey perhaps never to return to nebegard dear master said i what matter where my old bones lie after they have done serving you he kissed me and rode away to egeskoff i thought that the squire of nebbe had done with us sir borre began to sneer when ebbe found audience but the bride shows over my man and i give not my answer for a month yet your word is long to pledge and longer to redeem said ebbe i know that were i to wait a twelve month you would not of free will give me mette ah you know that do you well then you are right master lackland and the greater your impudence in hoping to wile from me through my daughter what you could not take by force ebbe replied i was prepared to find it difficult but let that pass as touching my lack of land i have nebegard left a poor estate and barren yet i think you would be glad of it to add to the lands of which you robbed us well said borre i would give a certain price for it but not my daughter nor anything near so precious to me give me one long ship said ebbe the swiftest of your seven which ride in the strait between egeskoff and stripe you shall take nebegard for her since i am weary of living at home and care little to live at all without mette borre's eyes shone with greed i commend you said he for a stout lad there is nothing like risking his life to win a fortune 
give me the deeds belonging to nebogard and you shall have my ship gold mary by your leave said ebby i have spent some time in watching your ships upon the fjord and the ship in my mind was the white wolf sir bory laughed to find himself outwitted for the white wolf could outsail all his fleet but in any case he had the better of the bargain and could afford to show some good humour moreover though he knew not that mette had any tenderness for this youth his spirits rose at the prospect of getting him out of the way so the bargain was struck and as nebby rode homewards to his castle for the last time he met the shepherd who had taken his former message the man was waiting for him and as you guess by mette's orders tell the lady mette said ebby that i have sold an abogard for the white wolf and that two nights from now my men will be aboard of her also that i sup with her father that evening before the boat takes me off from the bent ness so it was that two nights later ebby supped at egeskov and was kept drinking by the old knight for an hour maybe after the lady mette had risen and left the hall for her own room and at the end after the last speeding cup needs must sir bore who had grown friendly beyond all belief see him to the gate and stand there bareheaded among his torch-bearers while my master mounted the black stallion that was to bear him to bent ness three miles away where i waited with the boat but as ebby shook his rein and moved out of the torchlight came the damsel mette stealing out of the shadow upon the far side of the horse he reached down a hand and she took it and sprang up behind him for this bout sir bore i came with a fresh horse called my master blithely and so striking spur galloped off into the dark little chance had sir bore to overtake them the stallion was swift our boat waiting in the lee of the ness the wind southerly and fresh the white wolf ready for sea with sail hoisted and but one small anchor to get on board or cut away if need were but there was no need before the men of egeskov reached the ness and found there the black stallion roaming its riders were sailing out of the strait with a merry breeze so began our voyage my master was minded to sail for norway and take service under the king but first coming to the island of leso he must put ashore and seek a priest by whom he and the lady mette were safely made man and wife two days he spent at the island and then with fresh store of provisions we headed northward again it was past Skagen that our troubles began with a furious wind from the northeast against which there was no contending so that we ran from it and were driven for two days and a night into the wide sea even when it lessened the wind held in the east and we who could handle the ship but knew little of reckoning crept northward again in the hope to sight the coast of norway for two days we held on at this lying close by the wind and in good spirits although our progress was not much but on the third blew another gale this time from the southeast and for a week gale followed gale and we went in deadly peril yet never losing hope the worst was the darkness for the year was now drawing towards yule and as we pressed farther north we lost almost all sight of the sun at length with the darkness and the bitter cold and our stores running low we resolved to let the wind take us with what swiftness it might to whatsoever land it listed and so ran westward with darkness closing upon us 
and famine and a great despair but the lady mette did not lose heart and the worst of all our failing cupboard we kept from her so that she never lacked for plenty truly her cheerfulness paid us back and her love for my master the like of which i had not seen in this world no nor dreamed of hand in hand this pair would sit watching the ice which was our prison and the great north lights she close against ebby's side for warmth and i believe as happy as a bird he trembling for the end the worst was to see her at table pressing food to his mouth and wondering at his little hunger while his whole body cried out for the meat only it could not be spared though she must know soon none of us had the heart to tell her and not out of pity alone but because with her must die out the last spark by which we warmed ourselves but there came a morning i write it as of a long time ago and yet it was but yesterday praise be unto god there came a morning when i awoke and found that two of our men had died in the plight of frost and famine they must be hidden before my mistress discovered aught and so before her hour of waking we waited and dropped the bodies overside into deep water for the ice had not yet wholly closed about us now as i stooped i suppose that my legs gave way beneath me at any rate i fell and in falling struck my head against the bulwarks and opened my eyes in that unending dusk to find the lady mette stooping over me then somehow i was aware that she had called for wine to force down my throat and had been told that there was no wine and also that with this answer had come to her the knowledge full and sudden of our case better had we done to trust her than to hide it all this while for she turned to ebby who stood at her shoulder and is not this the feast of yule she asked my master bent his head but without answering ah she cried to him now i know what i have longed to know that your love is less than mine for you can love yet be doubtful of miracles while to me now that i have loved no miracle can be aught but small she bowed herself over me art dying old friend look up and learn that god being love deserts not lovers then she stooped and gathered as i thought a handful of snow from the deck but lo when she pressed it to my lips and i tasted it was heavenly mana and looking up past her face i saw the ribbons of the north lights fade in a great and wide sunlight bathing the deck and my frozen limbs nor did they feel it only but on the wind came the noise of bergs rending springs breaking birds singing many and curious and with that as i am a sinful man i gazed up into green leaves for either we had sailed into paradise or the timbers of the white wolf were swelling with sap and pushing forth bough upon bough yea and there were roses at the mast's foot and my fingers as i stretched them dabbled in mosses while i lay there breathing softly as one who dreams and fears to awake i heard her voice talking among the noises of birds and brooks and by the scent it seemed to be in a garden but whether it spake to me or to ebby i knew not nor cared the lord is my shepherd and guides me it said wherefore i lack nothing he maketh me to lie down in green pastures 
he leadeth me by comfortable streams he reviveth my soul yea though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i will fear no harm thy rod and thy staff they comfort me but a little after i knew that the voice spake to my master for it said let us go forth into the field o beloved let us lodge in the villages let us get up betimes to the vineyard and see if the vine have budded if its blossom be open the pomegranates in flower even there will i give thee my love then looking again i saw that the two had gone from me and left me alone but blessed be god they took not away the vision and now i know certainly that it is no cheat for here said i dipping my pen into the unfrozen ink and when a word will not come looking up into the broad branches and listening to the birds till i forget my story it is long since they left me but i am full fed and the ship floats pleasantly after so much misery i am as one rocked on the bosom of god and the pine resin has a pleasant smell author's note the courtship of ebby the poor esquire of nebogard and the maiden mette is a traditional tale of west jutland a version of it was englished by thorpe from carrot etler's even tear ogfogesogen fra Yeland. but this while it tells of ebby's adventures at the bride show and afterwards at the hunting party contains no account of the lovers escape and voyage or of the miracle which brought them comfort at the last indeed master kurt contradicts the common tale in many ways but above all in his ending wherein although he narrates a miracle I find him worthy of belief. End of section two. Section three of The White Wolf and Other Fireside Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The White Wolf and Other Fireside Tales by Sir Arthur Thomas Quiller Couch. Section 3. Sindbad on Verader. Part 1. I heard this story in a farmhouse upon Dartmoor, and I give it in the words of the local doctor who told it we were a reading party of three undergraduates and a christchurch don the don had slipped on a boulder two days before while fishing the river mevy and sprained his ankle hence dr miles visit the two had made friends over the don's fly book and the discovery that what the doctor did not know about dartmoor trout was not worth knowing hence an invitation to extend his visit over dinner at dinner the talk diverged from sport to the ancient tin-works stone circles camps and cromlechs on the tours about us and from there to touch speculatively on the darker side of the old religions hence at length the doctor story which he told over the pipes and whisky leaning his arms upon the table and gazing at it rather than at us as though drawing his memories out of the depths below its polished surface it must be thirty yes thirty years ago he said since i met the man on a bright november morning when the dartmoor hounds were drawing Berader wood Berader house in those days belonged to the rajah brook brook of sarawak who had bought it from harry tyrrell or rather it had been bought for him by the baroness burdett coutts and other admirers in england 
harry tyrrell a great sportsman in his day had been loath enough to part with it and when the bargain was first proposed had named at random a price which was about double what he had given for the place the rajah closed with the sum at once asked him to make a list of everything in the house and put a price on whatever he cared to sell tyrrell made a full list putting what seemed to him fair prices on most of the furniture and high ones prohibitive he thought on the sticks he had a fancy to keep the rajah glanced over the paper in his grand manner and says he i'll take it all stop stop cried tyrrell i bain't going to let you have the bed i was married in as you please we'll strike out the bed then the rajah answered that is how he took possession berater house as i dare say you know faces across the mevy upon berater wood and the wood thanks to trell had always been a sure draw for a fox i had tramped over from tavistock on this particular morning for i was new to the country a young man looking around me for a practice and did not yet possess a horse and i sat on the slope above the house at the foot of the tor watching the scene on the opposite bank the fixture always a favourite one and the rajah's hospitality which was noble like everything about him had brought out a large and brightly dressed field and among them in his black coat moved tyrrell on a horse twice as good as it looked he had ridden over from his new home and i dare say in the rush of old associations had forgotten for the while that the familiar place was no longer his the rajah a statue of a man sat on a tall grey at the covert's edge directly below me and from time to time i watched him through my field-glass he had lately recovered from a stroke of paralysis and was i am told the wreck of his old self but the old fire lived in the ashes he sat there tall lean upright as a ramrod with his eyes turned from the covert and gazing straight in front over his horse's ears on the rushing mevy he had forgotten the hounds his care for his guests was at an end and i wondered what thoughts what memories of the east possessed him there is always a loneliness about a great man don't you think but i have never felt one to be so terribly yes terribly alone as the rajah was that morning among his guests and the devonshire tours every inch a king said a voice at my elbow and a little man settled himself down on the turf beside me i set down my glasses with a start he was a spare dry fellow of about fifty dressed in what i took for the working suit of a mechanic certainly he did not belong to the moor he wore no collar but a dingy yellow handkerchief knotted about his throat and both throat and face were seamed with wrinkles so thickly seamed that at first glance you might take them for tattoo marks but i had time for a second for without troubling to meet my eyes he nodded towards the rajah i've cut a day's work and travelled out from plymouth to get a sight of him and i've a wife will pull my hair out when i get home and she finds i haven't been to the docks to-day and i've had no breakfast but thirty grains of opium but he's worth it thirty grains of opium i stared at him incredulous he did not turn but still with his eyes on the valley below us stretched out a hand its fingers were gnarled and looked like a bird's claw and on the little finger a ruby flashed in the morning sunlight not a large ruby but of the purest pigeon's blood shade and in any case a stone of price you see this my wife thinks it's a sham one but it's not and some day when i'm drunk or in low water i shall part with it but not yet you've an eye for it i see and yet he was not looking towards me but the rajah yonder and i are the only two within a hundred miles that can read what's in the heart of it he gazed for a second or two at the stone lifted it to his ear as if listening and lowering his hand to the turf bent over it 
and gazed again ay he could understand and see into you my beauty he could hear the little drum tum a rumbling and the ox bells and bangles tinkling and the shuffle of the elephants going by he could read the lust in you and the blood and the sun flickering and licking round the crisp that spilt it for it's the devil you have in you my dear but we know you he and i he and i ah there you go he muttered as the hounds broke into cry and the riders swept round the edge of the copse towards the sound of a view halloo there you go he nodded after the rajah but ride as you will the east is in you great man it's gold in your blood it's dust in your eyelids its own stink in your nostril and ride as you will you can never escape it he clasped his knees and leaned back against the slope following the grey horse and its rider with idolatrous gaze and i noted that one of the clasped hands lacked the two middle fingers you know him i asked you have seen him out there at sarawak i never saw him but i heard of him he smiled to himself it's not easy to pass certain gates in the east without hearing tell of the rajah brook for a while he sat nursing his knee while i filled and lit a pipe then he turned abruptly and over the flame of the match i saw his eyes the pupils clouded around the iris and as it were withdrawn inward and away from the world ever heard of kegayan sulu he asked never said i who or what is it it's an island said he it lies a matter of eighty miles off the northeast corner of borneo facing sandakan as you might say who owns it he seemed to be considering the question well he answered slowly if you asked the spanish government i suppose they'd tell you the king of spain but that's a lie if you asked the natives the haji hamid for instance you'd be told it belonged to them and that's half a lie and if you asked the father of lies he might tell you the truth and call me for witness i lost two fingers there the only english flesh ever buried in those parts so i've bought my knowledge how did you come there i asked if it's a fair question he chuckled without mirth as it happens that's not a fair question but i'll tell you this much i came there with a brass band i began to think the man out of his mind with the instruments that is i dropped the bandmaster on the way look here he went on sharply the beginning is funny enough but i'm telling you no lies we'll suppose there was a ship a british man of war name not necessary just now i think i understand i nodded oh no you don't said he i'm not a deserter at least not exactly or i shouldn't be telling this to you well, well we'll suppose this ship bound from labuan to hong kong with orders to keep along the north side of borneo to start with and do a bit of exploring by the way this would be in forty nine when the british government had just taken over labuan very good next we'll suppose the captain puts in at kudat in marudu bay to pay a polite call on the rajah there or some understrapper of the sultan's and takes his ship's band ashore by way of compliment and that the band gets too drunk to play annie laurie he chuckled again i never saw such a band as we were down by the water's edge and o'hara the bandmaster took on and played the fool to such a tune while we waited for the boat to take us aboard that for the very love i bore him i had to knock him down and sit on him in a quiet corner while i sat keeping guard on him i must have dropped asleep myself for the next i remember was waking up to find the beach deserted and the boat gone this put me in a sweat of course but after groping some while about the foreshore which was as dark as the inside of your hat i tripped over a rope and so found a native boat o'hara wouldn't wake so i just lifted him on board like a sack tossed in his cornet in my bombardon 
tumbled in on top of them and started to row for dear life towards the ship's light in the offing but the rajah or rather his servants had filled us up with a kind of sticky drink that only begins to work when you think it about time to leave off i must have pulled miles towards that ship and every time i cast an eye over my shoulder her light was shining just as far away as ever at last i remember feeling sure i was bewitched and with that i must have tumbled off the thwart in a sound sleep when i awoke i had both arms round the bombardon there wasn't a sight of land or of the ship anywhere and if you please the sun was near sinking this time i managed to wake up o'hara we had splitting headaches the pair of us but we snatched up our instruments and started to blow on them like mad not a soul heard though we blew till the sweat poured down us and kept up the concert pretty well all through the night you may think it funny and i suppose we did amount to something like a joke we two bandsmen booming away at the popular airs of old england and the huntsman's course under those everlasting stars you wouldn't say so if you had been the audience when o'hara broke down and began to confess his sins luckily the sea kept smooth and next morning i took the oars in earnest we had no compass and i was famished but i stuck to it steering by the sun and pulling in the direction where i supposed land to lie o'hara kept a lookout we saw nothing however and down came the night again though the hunger had been gnawing and griping me for hours yet dog-tired as i was i curled myself at the bottom of the boat and slept and dreamed i was on board ship again and in my hammock a sort of booming in my ears awoke me looking up i saw daylight around clear morning light and blue sky and right overhead as it were a great cliff standing against the blue and there in the face of day o'hara sat on the thwart tugging like mad now cricking his neck almost to stare up at the cliff and now grinning down at me in silly triumph with that i caught at the meaning of the sound in my ears you infernal fool i shouted staggering up and making to snatch the paddle from him get her nose round to it and back her for it was the noise of breaking water but i was too late our boat i must tell you was a sort of dutch pram about twelve feet long and narrowing at the bows which stood well out of the water handy enough for beaching but not to be taken through breakers by reason of its sitting low in the stern o'hara as i yelled at him pulled his starboard paddle and brought her for these prams spin around easily almost broadside on to a tall comber as we slid up the side of it and hung there i had a glimpse of a steep clean fissure straight through the wall of rock ahead and in that instance o'hara sprawled his arms and toppled overboard the boat and i went by him with a rush i saw a hand and wrist lifted above the foam but when i looked back for them they were gone gone as i shot over the bar and through the cleft into smooth water i shouted and pulled back to the edge of the breakers but he was gone and i never saw him again i suppose it was ten minutes before i took heart to look about me i was floating on a lake of the bluest water i ever set eyes on and as calm as a pond except by the entrance where the spent waves after tumbling over the bar spread themselves in long ripples widening and widening until the edge of them melted and they were gone the banks of the lake rose sheer from its edge or so steeply that i saw no way of climbing them walls you might call them a good hundred feet high and widening gradually towards the top but in a circle as regular as ever you could draw with a pair of compasses any fool could see what had happened that here was the crater of a dead volcano one side of which had been broken into by the sea but the beauty of it sir coming on top of my weakness fairly made me cry 
for the walls at the top were fringed with palms and jungle trees and hung with creepers like curtains that trailed over the face of the cliff and down among the ferns by the shore i leaned over the boat and stared into the water it was clear clear you've no notion how clear but no bottom could i see it seemed to sink right through and into the sea on the other side of the world well all this was mighty pretty but it didn't tell me where to find a meal so i bailed out the boat and paddled along the eastern edge of the lake searching the cliffs for a path and after an hour or so i hit on what looked to me like a foot track zigzagging up through the creepers and across the face of the rock i determined to try it made the boat fast to a clump of fern slung o'hara's cornet on to my side belt and began to climb i saw no marks of footsteps but the track was a path all right through a teaser a dozen times i had to crawl on hands and knees under the creepers creepers with stems as thick as my two wrists and once about two-thirds of the way up i was forced to push sideways through a crevice dripping with water and so steep underfoot that i slid twice and caked myself with mud i very nearly gave out here but it was do or die and after ten minutes more of scratching pushing and scrambling i reached the top and sat down to mop my face and recover i dare say it was another ten minutes before i fetched breath enough and looked about me and as i turned my head there close behind me lay another crater with another lake smiling below all blue and peaceful as the one i had left i gazed from one to the other this new crater had no opening on the sea its sides were steeper though not quite so tall and either my eyes played a trick or its water stood at a higher level i stood there comparing the two when suddenly against the skyline and not two hundred yards away i caught sight of a man he was walking towards me around the edge of the crater and halting every now and then to stare down at my boat he might be a friend or he might be a foe but anyway it was not for me in my condition to choose which so i waited for him to come up and first i saw that he carried a spear and wore a pair of wide dirty white trousers and a short coat embroidered with gold and next that he was a true malay pretty well on in years with a greyish beard falling over his chest he had no shirt but a scarlet sash wrapped about his waist and holding a kris and two long pistols handsomely inlaid with gold in spite of his weapons he seemed to be a benevolent old boy he pointed towards my boat and tried me with a few questions first in his own language then in spanish of which i knew very little beyond the sound but i spread out my hands towards the sea by way of explaining our voyage and then pointed to my mouth if he understood he seemed in no hurry he tapped o'hara's cornet gingerly with two fingers i unstrung it and made shift to play home sweet home this delighted him he nodded rubbed his hands and stepped a few paces from me then turned and began fingering his spear in a way i did not like at all it's a matter of taste sir said i or words to that effect dropping the cornet like a hot potato but he pointed towards it and then over a ridge inland and i gathered i must pick it up and follow him which i did and pretty quick from the top of this ridge we faced across a small plain bounded on the north with a tier of hills most of which seemed by their shape to be volcanoes and out of action for the sky lay quite blue and clear above them the way down into this plain led through jungle but the plain itself had been cleared of all but small clumps dotted here and there which gave it you might say the look of an english park and about halfway across in a clear stretch of la longue grass stood a village of white huts huddling round a larger and much taller house the old man led me straight towards this and coming closer i saw that the large house had a rough glacis about it and a round wall pierced with loopholes a number of goats were feeding here and a few small cattle 
also the ground about the village had been cleared and planted with fruit trees mangoes bananas limes and oranges but as yet i saw no inhabitants the old malay who had kept ahead of me all the way walking at a fair pace here halted and once more signed to me to blow on the cornet i obeyed of course this time with the british grenadiers i declare to you it was like starting a swarm of bees you wouldn't believe the troops that came pouring out of those few huts the women in loose trousers pretty much like the men's but with arms bare and loose sarongs flung over their right shoulders the children with no more clothes than a pocket handkerchief apiece i can't tell you what first informed me of my guide's rank among them whether the salams they offered him or the richness of his dress he was the only one with gold lace and the only one who carried pistols or the air with which he paraded me through the crowd waving the people back to right and left and clearing away to a narrow door in the wall around the great house a man armed with a long fowling piece saluted him at the entry and once inside he pointed from the house to his own breast as much as to say i am the chief and this is mine i saluted him humbly a veranda ran around the four sides of the house with a trench between it and the fortified wall a plank bridge led across the trench to the veranda steps where my master or to call him by his right name haji hamid halted again and clapped his hands a couple of young malay women dressed like those i had passed in the street ran out in answer and were ordered to bring me food while it was preparing i rested on a low chair blinking at the sunlight on the fortified wall it had been pierced on the side of the house for eleven guns but six of the embrasures were empty and of the five pieces standing no two were alike in size age or manufacture and the best seemed to be a nine-pounder strapped to its carriage with rope haji hamid saw what i was looking at and chuckled to himself solemnly all through the meal which began with a mess of rice and chopped fowl and ended with bananas he sat beside me chewing beetle touching this thing and that naming it in his language and making me repeat the words after him he smiled at every mistake but never lost his patience indeed it was clear that my quickness delighted him and i did my best wondering all the while what he meant to do with me well to be short sir he intended to keep me i believe he would have done it for the sake of the cornet but before i had finished eating up stepped a sentry escorting a man with my bombardon under his arm i had left it as you know in the boat and had heard no order given but the boat i never saw again and here was my bombardon haji hamid took it in both hands felt it all over patted it and ended by turning it over to me and calling in dumb show for a tune i tell you my performance was a success at the first blast he leaned back suddenly in his chair at the second he turned a kind of purple under his yellow skin but at the third he caught hold of his stomach and began to roll in his seat and laugh you never saw a man laugh like it he made scarcely any sound he was too near apoplexy to speak but the tears ran down his face and one minute his hand would be up waving feebly to me to stop the next he'd be signalling to go on again i wanted poor o'hara he used to give himself airs and swear at my playing but among these people he and his coronet would have had to stand down they gave me a bed that night in a corner of the veranda and next morning my master came himself to wake me and took me down to the village bathing pool just below the fortifications it hurt my modesty to find the whole mob of inhabitants gathered there and waiting and it didn't set me at ease exactly to notice that each man carried his spear for one nasty moment i pictured a duck hunt with me playing duck but there was no cause for alarm at a signal from hamid who stripped and led the way in we tumbled together men women and children the men first laying their spears on the bank beside their clothes 
six remained on shore to keep guard and were relieved after five minutes by another six from the pool there was a good deal of splashing and horseplay but nothing you could call immodest though my fair skin came in for an amount of attention i had to get used to my breakfast was served to me alone and soon after i was summoned to attend my master in one of the state rooms of the house i found him on a shaded platform seated opposite an old native as well dressed and venerable looking as himself but stouter the pair lolled on cushions at either end of the platform smoking and smoothing their grey beards i understood that the visitor was a personage and somehow that he had been sent for expressly to hear and be astonished by my performance the two instruments were brought in upon cushions and i began to play the visitor who had less sense of humour than hamid did not laugh at all instead he took the mouthpiece of his chibouk slowly from his lips and held it at a little distance while his mouth and eyes opened wider and wider hamid eyed him keenly with a kind of triumph under his lids and the triumph grew as the old man's stare lit up with a jealousy there was no mistaking this too passed as i wound up with a flourish and stood at attention waiting for orders the visitor put out his hand but as i offered him the barmbadon he waved it aside impatiently and pointed to the cornet i passed it up to him he patted and examined it for a while laid it on his knee and the two men began talking in low voices i could see that compliments were passing but you'll guess i wasn't prepared for what followed hamid stood up suddenly and whispered to one of his six guards stationed below the platform the man went out and returned in five minutes followed by a girl now that the island girls were beautiful i had already discovered that morning and this one was no exception a small thing about five feet with glossy black hair and the tiniest feet and hands she seemed to me to walk nervously as if brought up for punishment and a thought took me and i shall be glad of it when i come to die that if they meant to ill-use her i might do worse than assault that venerable pair with my barmbadon and end my adventures with credit my eyes were so taken up with the girl that for a full minute i paid no attention to my master she had come to a halt under the platform a couple of paces from me with her eyes cast down upon the floor and he on the platform was speaking by and by he stopped and glancing up i saw that he was motioning me to leave the room well they had made no show as yet of ill-treating her so i flung her one more look and obeyed feeling pretty mean i went out into the veranda walked the length of it and turned and there stood the girl right before me her little feet had followed me so softly that i had heard nothing and now as i stared at her she crept close with a sort of sidelong motion and knelt at my feet at the same moment drawing her sarong over her head to hide it then the truth came upon me i was married aoudya was her name what else can i tell you about her to describe her she was a child and all life came as play to her yet she understood love to the tips of her little matter brown fingers she was my teacher too and i sat at her feet day after day and learned while she drilled the island language into me learned by the hour while she untwisted her hair and rubbed it with grated coconut and broke off her toilet to point to this thing and that and tell me its name laughing at my mistakes or flipping bits of beetle at me by way of reward i had no wife at home to vex my conscience at all all day we played about hamid's veranda like two children and hamid watched us with a sort of twinkle in his eye seemingly well content it was plain he had taken a fancy to me and i thought as time passed he grew friendlier i bless the old fellow too had he not given me aouja 
i puzzled my head over this favour until aoudja explained you see she said it was done to oblige the haji hassan this was the old man who had listened to my performance on the bombardon he lived in a stockaded house on the far side of the island the chieftaincy of which he and hamid shared between them and without dispute how should it oblige hassan i asked because hassan could not see or hear my lord and lover without longing to possess such a man for his very own as who could and here she blew me a kiss thank you jewel of my heart said i but yet i don't see was it me he wanted or the bombardon i fancy he thought of you together but of course he did not ask for the big thing that would have been greedy he would be content with the little one the what you call cornet and don't you see no doubt it's stupid of me my dear said i but i'll be shot if i do she was sitting with a lapful of pandanus leaves blue and green weaving a mat of them while we talked and had just picked out a beater from the tools scattered round her a flat piece of board with a bevelled edge and shaped away to a handle stupid she says to me just like so and at the same time wraps me over the hand smartly he thought if peradventure there came to us a little one with a what you call cornet i clapped my hand to my mouth over a guffaw and with that she who had started laughing too came to a stop with her eyes fastened on the back of it i saw them stiffen and the pretty round pupils draw in and shrink to narrow slits like a cat's and her arm went back slowly behind her and her bosom leaned nearer and nearer i thought she was going to spring at me and as my silly laugh died out i turned my hand and held it palm outward to fend her off on the back of it was a drop of blood where the bevelled edge of the beater had by accident broken the skin somehow this movement of mine seemed to fetch her to bearings her hand came slowly forward again hesitated seemed to hover for a moment at her throat then went swiftly down to her bosom between bodice and flesh and came up again tugging after it what looked to me a piece of coarse thread she tossed it into my lap as i still sat there cross-legged and with that sprang up and raced away from me down to the veranda there was no chance of catching her and i was to tell the truth a bit too much taken aback to try i picked up the string on it was threaded a silk purse no bigger than a shilling and from this i shook into my palm a small stone like an opal i turned it over once or twice put it back in the purse and stowed string purse and all in my breeches pocket end of section three Section 4 of The White Wolf and Other Fireside Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The White Wolf and Other Fireside Tales by Sir Arthur Thomas Quiller Couch. Section 4 sindbad on berater part two i strolled down the veranda to our quarters in search of aoudja but the room was empty and after that i'm afraid i smoked and sulked for the rest of the day until nightfall after playing the haji hamid through his meal i went out to our favourite seat on the edge of the dry ditch when she came to me out of nowhere across the withered grass of the compound have you the charm o oh, beloved she whispered oh it's a charm is it said i partly sulky yet yes and you must never lose it never part with it never above all give it back to me promise me that beloved and i who have wept much am happy again so i promised and she snuggled close to me and all was as before 
no more was said between us and by next morning she seemed to have clean forgotten the affair but i thought of it at times and it puzzled me now as i said my master had taken a fancy to me quite apart from the bombardon and a token of it was his constantly taking me out as companion on his walks you may think it odd that he never troubled about my being an unbeliever for of course he held by the prophet and so did all the islanders Aouja included but in fact though his people called themselves mohammedans each man treated his religion much as he chose and hamid talked to me as freely as if i had been his son in this way i learned a deal of the island and its customs and of the terms by which hamid and hassan between them shared its rule but that any others laid claim to it i had no idea until one day as we were walking on the coast and not far from the crater where he had found me first my master asked suddenly was i happy quite happy i answered you would not leave us if you could he went on and began to laugh quiet like behind his beard oh ho love love i then am old have been merry in my day we walked for another mile maybe without speaking and came to the edge of a valley look down yonder said he below us and in the mouth of the valley which grew broad and shallow as it neared the sea i saw a hill topped by a round wall and compound there might have been half a dozen houses within the compound all thatched and above them stood up a flag painted in red and yellow stripes and so stiff in the breeze that with half an eye you could tell it was no bunting but a sheet of tin hello said i spaniards puff hamid grinned at the flag and spat a captain marquinas inhabits there with four manila men and their wives he is a sensible fellow and does no harm and if it pleases him to hoist that toy on a bamboo he is welcome they claim the island then what matters it if they claim there was a letter once came to us from the spanish governor in tolo that man was a fool he gave us warning that by order of the government at manila he would send a hundred men to build a fort inland and set up a garrison hassan and i took counsel together he is a fool said hassan but we must answer him so we answered him thus send your men to-day they come to-morrow they die yet trouble not we will bury them were they sent i asked they were not sent he was a fool yet within bounds nevertheless a time may come for us not for hassan and me we shall die in our beds but for our sons even for this we are prepared he would have said more but checked himself i learned later on that the islanders kept one of the craters fortified for emergency to make a last stand there but they never allowed me to see the place we have gods of our own said hamid slyly who will be helpful the more so that we do not bother them over trifles also there are other things and the lake singuan and another which you have not seen are full of crocodiles he stamped his foot my son beneath this spot there has been fire and still the men of Kagayan walk warily and go not without their spears for you it is different yet when you come upon aught that puzzles you it were well to put no questions even to yourself not even about this i asked and showed him the purse and stone which Aouja had tossed to me you are in luck's way said he whoever gave you that he pulled a small pouch from his breast opened it and showed me a stone exactly like mine it is a coconut pearl keep it near to your hand and forget not to touch it if you hear noises in the air or a man meet you with eyes like razors i wanted to ask him more but he started to walk back hastily and when i caught him up would talk of nothing but the sugar and sweet potato crops and the yield of coconut oil to be carried to kudat at the next northeast monsoon 
i noticed that the fruit trees planted along the shore were old and that scores of them had ceased bearing they will last my day said he let my sons plant others if they so will he always spoke in this careless way of his children and i believe he had many for an islander keeps as many wives as he can afford but they lived about the villages and could not be told from the other inhabitants by any sign of rank or mark of favour he showed them for a long while i believed that aouja must be a daughter of his she always denied it but owned that she had never known her mother and had lived in hamid's house ever since she could remember anyhow he took the greatest care of me and never allowed me to join the expeditions which sailed twice a year from the island to palawan for patty and to the north of borneo with oil and nuts and pandanus mats he may have mistrusted me but more likely he forbade it out of care for me and the music i played for the brahus regularly came back with three or four of their number missing either capsized on the voyage or blown away towards tawi tawi where the pirates accounted for them though i might not sail abroad he allowed me to join the tubering parties off the shore we would work along the reefs there in rafts of bamboo towing with us two or three dugouts filled with mashed tuber roots at the right spot the dugouts would be upset and after a while the fish came floating up on their sides or belly uppermost to be speared by us for the root puddles the water like milk and stupefies them somehow without hurting the flesh which in an hour or so is fit to eat we had been tubering one afternoon and put back with our baskets filled to a spit of the shore where we had left an old islander kotali by name alone and tending a fire for our meal coming near we saw him stretched on the sand by his cooking pots and shouted to wake him for his fire was low kotali did not stir i was one of the first to jump ashore and run to him he lay with his legs drawn up his hands clenched his eyes wide open and staring at us horribly the man was as dead as a nail i never saw people worse frightened the burbalangs said some one in a dreadful sort of whisper and we started to run back to the raft for our lives i with the rest for the panic had taken hold of me though i could see no sign of an enemy i suppose these burbalangs named with such awe to be pirates or marauders from tawi tawi or some neighbouring island and the first hint that reached me of anything worse was a wailing sound which grew as we ran and overhauled us until the air was filled with roaring so that i swung round to defend myself yet could see nothing to my surprise a man who had been running beside me dropped on the sand pulled a sigh of relief and began to mop his face and this in the very worst of the racket they are gone by he shouted the worse the noise the farther off they are they have taken their fill to-day on poor old katali suddenly the noise ceased altogether and we picked up courage to return and bury the body we had a basket of limes on the raft and these were fetched and the juice squeezed over the grave but no one seemed inclined to answer the questions i put about these burblangs it seemed that unless they were close at hand there was ill luck even in mentioning them and i walked back to the village in a good deal of perplexity i should tell you sir that by this time i was the father of a fine boy and that aouja doted on him when she was not feeding him or calling on me to admire his perfections from the cleverness of his smile to the beautiful shape of his toes he lay and slept or kicked in a basket slung on a long bamboo fastened across the rafters aouja would give the basket a pull and this set it bobbing up and down on the spring of the bamboo for minutes at a time now when i reached home with my string of fish i walked round to the back of the house to clean them before going in this took me past the window of our room and glancing inside the window was unglazed you understand i saw aouja standing before the cradle and talking quick 
and angry with a man posted in the doorway opening on the veranda i was not jealous the thought never entered my head but i dropped my fish and whipped round to the doorway in time to catch him as he turned to go having heard my footstep belike who the something or other are you i asked and what's your business in my private house the man a yellow-faced figure but young in figure muttered something in a gibberish new to me and made as if excusing himself it gave me an ugly start to see that his eyes were yellow too with long slits for pupils but i saw too that he was afraid of me and being in a towering rage myself i out with my chris now look here i said i don't understand what you say but maybe you understand this walk and if i catch you here again you'll need someone to sew you up i watched him as he went across the compound the guard at the gate scarcely looked up and if the thing hadn't been impossible there in the broad daylight i could have fancied he saw no one i turned to aoudya and took her hands for she was trembling from head to foot at my touch she burst out sobbing clung to my shoulder and begged me to protect her why of course i will said i more cheerfully than i felt by a long sight if i'd known you were frightened like this i'd have slit his body to match his eyes but who is he at all he he said he was my brother she wailed and clung to me again i cannot i cannot oh brother him cried i but what is it he wants i cannot i cannot was all she would say and now her sobs were so loud that the child woke up screaming and had to be soothed and this seemed to do her good well i got her to bed and asleep early that night but before morning i had a worse fright than ever somehow in my dream i had a feeling come to me that the bed was empty and sat up suddenly half awake and scared aoudya had risen and was standing by the cradle with one hand on its edge in the other was the lamp a clam-shell fastened in a split handle of bamboo and holding a pithwick and a little oil the flame wavered against her eyes as she held it up and peered into the baby's face and her eyes were like as i had seen them once before and devilish like the eyes i had seen in another face that afternoon a man never knows what he can do till the call comes there betwixt sleep and waking i knew that happiness had come to an end for us yet i slipped out of bed very softly took the lamp from her as gentle as you please set it on a stool and turning reached out for her two wrists and held them for how long i can't tell you she didn't try to fend me away or struggle at all and not a word did i utter but stood holding her the babe asleep beside us and listened to her breathing until it grew easier and she leaned to me weak as water then i let go and lifting the child's head from the pillow pulled aoudya's charm the coconut pearl from my neck and hung it about his that's for you sonny said i and if the berberlangs come along you can pass them on to your father i faced round on aoudya with a smile which no doubt was thin enough though honestly meant to hearten her it's all right old girl come back to bed said i and held her in my arms until i fell asleep in the dawn but of course it was not all right and after two days spent with this dismal secret between us and aoudya all the while play-acting at her old tricks of love for me and the babe as if god knows i doubted they and not the horror were her real self i could stand it no longer but did what i ought to have done before sought out my master and made a clean breast of it i could see that it took the old man between wind and water when i had done he sat for some time pulling his beard and eyeing me once or twice rather queerly as i thought 
my friend said he at last i suppose you will be suspecting me yet i give you my word and the haji hamid is no liar that if aouja is a berbalang or a daughter of berbalangs the same was unknown to me when i married you i'll believe that i answered the more by token that i never suspected you she had no known father which as you know is held a disgrace among us so much a disgrace that she grew up without suitors in spite of her looks and my favour therefore i seized my chance of giving her a husband and in that i am not guiltless toward you but of anything worse i was ignorant and for proof i am going to help you if i can he frowned to himself still tugging at his beard her mother was of good family on this side of the island therefore she cannot be pure berbalang and most likely the berbalangs have no more than a fetch upon her he used a word new to me but fetch i took to be the meaning of it if so we must go to them and persuade them to take it off they owe me something for though as we value peace and quiet hassan and i leave them alone in their own dirty village and ask no tax nor homage we could make things uncomfortable if we chose yes yes said he i think it can be done but it will be dangerous you are wearing your coconut pearl of course i told him that i had given it up to the baby he nodded yes that was well done but you must borrow it for the day run and fetch it at once we have a long walk before us so i ran back and without telling aouja who was washing her linen behind the house slipped the pearl off the child's neck and returned to hamid i found him with two spears in his hand waiting for me he gave me one and forth we set the berbalang's village stands on a sort of table-land in the hills which rise all the way to mount tabulian near the centre of the island after the first two miles i found myself in strange country and hamid kept silence and signed me to do the same in this way we sweated up the slopes until a little after noon we reached a pass and saw the roofs of the village over the edge of a broad step as it were half a mile above us here we sat down and hamid drawing a couple of limes from his pocket explained that i must on no account taste any food the berbalangs set before us unless i first sprinkled it with lime juice it might look like curried fish but would as likely as not be human flesh disguised the taste of which would destroy my soul and convert me into a berbalang a touch of the lime juice would turn such food back to its proper shape and show me what i was being asked to eat we now moved forward again very cautiously and soon came to the village the houses perhaps a dozen in all were scandalously dirty otherwise pretty much like those in hamid's own village but not a living creature could be seen hamid i could tell was puzzled and even a bit frightened he put a good face on it all the same and began to walk from house to house keeping his spear handy as he peered in at the doors still not a soul could we find barring an old goat tethered and a few roaming fowls the stink of the place sickened us and i wanted to run though we came across no actual horrors in one room we found a pan of rice lately boiled and still smoking and sprinkled it with lime juice it remained good rice out into the street we went and hamid growing bolder raised a loud halloo the noise of it sent the fowls scudding and the hills around took it up and echoed it he looked at me they must be out on the hunt said he good lord i gasped and the child at home without the pearl i turned and plunged for it down the slope like a madman what to do i had no idea but i hadn't a doubt that the berbalangs were after aouja or the child or both and i headed for home with the wind singing by my ears at the foot of the pass i looked back 
hamid was following skipping from one lava stone to another at a pace that did credit to his old legs he waved a hand and called as i thought to encourage me and away down i pounded i must have reached the edge of the plain in twenty minutes the climb had taken us more than two hours and once there i squeezed my elbows into my sides and settled into stride luckily the season was dry and a fire three weeks before had swept over the tall lalang grass leaving a thin layer of ash which made running easy for all that i was pretty near dead beat when i reached the compound and ran past the sentry the man cried out at sight of me as i went by but i thought he was just pattering out his challenge being taken unawares and knowing he would not let off his musket if he recognized me i paid no attention i had prepared myself as i thought for anything to find aoudja dead beside the child or to find them both unharmed and flourishing as i had left them but what happened was that i burst in and stared around an empty room that knocked the wind out of my sails i called twice leaned my head against the door-post and panted called again and getting no answer walked stupidly back across the compound to the gate the sentry there was pointing i believe he was telling me too that aoudja with the child in her arms had passed out some while before but as he waved a hand towards the plain i saw a figure running there and recognized hamid the old man was heading not towards us but for the seashore and plain as daylight he was heading there with a purpose i remembered now his cry to me from the head of the pass so i pressed elbows to side again and lit out after him he was making for a thick patch of jungle between us and the sea and though i had run at least a mile out of the way i soon began to overhaul him but long before i reached the clump he had found an opening in it and dived out of sight and i overtook him only when the growth thinned suddenly by the edge of a crater plunging down to a lake so exactly like sinquan that i had to look about me and take my bearings before making sure that this was another and one i had never yet seen i caught him by the arm and we peered down the slope together at the foot of it and by the edge of the lake there ran a strip of white beach and there and almost directly below us were gathered the berbalangs they were moving and pushing into place in a sort of circle around a small bundle which at first sight i took for a heap of clothes at that distance they seemed harmless enough and barring the strangeness of the spot might have been an ordinary party of islanders forming up for a dance but when all of a sudden the ring came to a standstill and a figure stepped out of it towards the bundle in the centre my wits came back to me and i flung up both arms shouting aoudja aoudja she must have made three paces in the time my voice took to reach her she was close to the child then she halted and stood for a moment gazing up at me i saw something bright drop from her and with that she stooped caught up the child and was racing up the slope towards us steady muttered hamid as a man broke from the circle plucked up the knife from the sand and rushed after her steady he said again aoudja had a start of twenty yards or more and in the first half minute she actually managed to better it hamid beside me rubbed a bullet quickly on the rind of one of his lime fruits and rammed it home he took an eternal time about it and below now the man was gaining unluckily their courses brought them into line and twice the old man cursed softly and lowered his piece flesh and blood could not stand this i let out a groan and sprang down the cliff it was madness and at the third step all foothold slipped from under me but my clutch was tight on a fistful of creepers and their tendrils were tough as a ship's rope 
so down i went now touching earth now fending off from the rock with my feet now missing hold and sprawling into a mass of leaves and roots among which i clutched wildly and checked myself by the first thing handy until with a crack of hamid's musket above the vine or whatever it was to which i clung for the moment gave way as if shorn by the bullet and i pitched a full twenty feet with a rush of loose earth and dust i fell almost at the heels of aoudja's enemy upon a ledge along which he was swiftly running her down hamid's bullet had missed him and before i could make the third in the chase he was forty yards ahead i saw his bare shoulders parting the creepers threading their way in and out like a bobbin and jogging as the pace fell slower for now we were all three in difficulties perhaps aoudja had missed the track at any rate the ledge we were now following grew shallower as it curved over the corner of the beach and ran sheer over the water of the lake a jungle tree leaned out to there with a clear drop of a hundred feet as i closed on my man he swerved and began to clamber out along the trunk and over his shoulder i saw aoudja with the babe in the crick of her arm upon a bough which swayed and sank beneath her i clutched at his ankle he reached back with a hiss of his breath and jabbed his knife down on my left hand cutting across the two middle fingers and pinning me through the small bones to the trunk i tell you sir i scarcely felt it my right went down to my waist and pulled out the chris there he was the man i had caught within the veranda three days before these were the same eyes shining like a cat's back into mine and what i had promised him then i gave him now but it was hamid who killed him for as my chris went into the flank of him above the hip hamid's second shot cut down through his neck his face at the moment rested sideways against the branch and i suppose the bullet passed through to the bow and cost me aoudja for as the berberlang fell the bow seemed to rip away from where his cheek had rested and aoudja with my child in her arms swung back under my feet and dropped like a stone into the lake i can't tell you sir how long i lay stretched out along that trunk with the berberlang's knife still pinned through my hand i was staring down into the water aoudja and my child never rose again but the berberlang came to the surface at once and floated bobbing for a while on the ripple his head thrown back his brown chest shining up at me and the blood spreading on the water around it it was hamid who unpinned me and led me away he had made shift to climb down and while binding up my wounded hand pointed towards the beach it was empty the crowd of berberlangs had disappeared he found the track which aoudja had missed and as he led me up and out of the crater i heard him talking talking i suppose he was trying to comfort me he was a good fellow but at the top i turned on him and master i said you have tried to do me much kindness but to-day i have bought my quittance with that i left him standing and walked straight over the brow of the hill i never looked behind me until i reached the spaniard's compound and called out at the gate to be let pass captain marquinas was lying in a hammock in the cool of his veranda when the gatekeeper took me to him he was i think the weariest man i ever happened on so you want to leave the island said he when my tale was out yes yes i believe you i've learnt to believe anything of those devils up yonder but you must wait a fortnight till the relief boat arrives from hola here the story-teller broke off as a rider upon a grey horse came at a foot-pace round the slope of berater below us and passed on without seeing it was the rajah returning solitary from the hunt and his eyes were still fastened ahead of him ah great man england is a weary hole for the likes of you and me it's here they talk of the east 
but we have loved it and hated it and known it and remember our eyes have seen our eyes have seen he stood up pulled himself together with a kind of shiver and suddenly shambled away across the slope having said no good-bye but leaving me there at gaze end of section four